And I don't know how to follow such a powerful uh, talk uh, by Ali, actually. It did, it did make me think uh, about a couple of things, but um, my job title, Director of External Affairs, sounds pretty meaningless, actually. I think if I, if I say what, what we do, it's about uh, mainstreaming public health issues. Public health tends to have a reputation of being something done in ivory towers to people. What we try and do is um, create a dialogue and actually co-produce and co-develop a research with people on issues that matter, but kind of informed by expert opinion. And that's, that's kind of the methodology that we've, we've taken with this research. Um, and it has been headline grabbing and, and um, it, it has attracted a huge amount of media. Um, just, to, uh, just to give credit to Matt uh, Karaka who actually developed the report actually, all, all credit to Matt. So I'm, I'm shamelessly kind of basking in his glory here. Don't really go for it. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do is uh, give, I won't talk for very long, about 20 minutes or so, I'll give some background on who we are as an organisation, if you don't mind, and then just a little bit about why we embarked on the research. Um, and then I'm going to give you an example of the methodology we undertook from a different campaign, just to give you a sense of, of how we developed this research. Then I'm going to talk about the, the results, um, what we're calling for, uh, and then I'm going to show you a little film at the end, which is about two minutes long. Um, so, um, that's right, so I can't go back, so I better make sure I'm confident that we've moved on. Um, as an organisation, RSPH, um, our, our vision is for everybody to optimise optimise their health and well-being for everybody. Uh, we're, very, we're particularly interested in health inequalities and, and tackling those. Um, we are an independent public health um, body. Um, we're the world's first um, uh, public health body and we have over 6,000 members drawn from everybody from the frontline services right through to academia, directors of public health, etc. And it's a very exciting area I cover everything from calorie labelling to chlamydia, so there's never a dull moment. Um, and we are a health education body as well, so we do train and provide qualifications and stuff. Um, the research was a co-produced, co-designed piece of work uh, with the Young Health Movement. So what we do is we train um, peer, peer champions on health and wellbeing in schools and in informal education. And to support the Young Health Champions, we've developed a Young Health Movement, which enables us to um, put our campaigns through a network which enables discussion in schools and in informal education. Um, so, uh, a little quiz for you. So, it was our 160th anniversary uh, this time last year, um, and to commemorate that, we um, reimagined a famous piece of art uh, that is uh, Gin Lane from 1751, which shows the ruinous effects of gin on the population of London. And if you see in the foreground, the, the only two thriving businesses in, in this uh, city are the pawnbroker and the gin distillery. And I guess what it showed to us is the importance of place and environment and in, in shaping people's health and wellbeing. Um, Place is very important. Um, you know, the, the emphasis on individual and individual behaviour is, is very much wrong. We are very firm believers that the social determinants have a huge impact on people's health and well-being. Um, what we wanted to do, uh, we commissioned a, an up-and-coming artist, uh, Thomas Murphy, who is now apparently London's top illustrator, um, to reimagine Gin Lane for the 21st century. Um, and this is the result. It, um, it actually depicts the obesogenic environment. It, it, the, the detail is, is very great. I mean, you, you look at the, the impact of um, people on their phones coming out the tube station, their gin lane tube station, glued to their phone. Um, the, um, you see at the top there a chap 
you know, threatening to throw himself off a, 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 the top of a building. But little quiz. Uh, put your hand up or shout out. I can't remember. If I've said it and said the answer now. <laughs> um, who was the artist that <coughs> created the original gym line? Oh, uh, right. And a uh, little prize for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we have here a gin lane tea towel. <laughs> you can buy them from our website for twelve pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, shame on you. To you, six pounds. No, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so so in terms of place. Um, or settings as, as the public health lingo goes, uh, the WHO definition is, is health is created where people live, work, play and love. And uh, we've looked at settings in a number of different places, so community settings, the school, the workplace, and it's great to hear about your work on uh, mental well-being in the workplace. Um, last year we did a great report called Health in a Hurry which looked at the commuting setting and the obesogenic train stations and all of that and how, how that can actually have an impact on people's health and well-being and the stress of commuting. Nobody's really looked at on the online and the, the internet and, and the digital as a setting and it really is a setting these days. We spend so much time on the internet and, and on social media. So with that in mind we wanted to explore the setting of social media. Um, Another thing to say is some of the statistics that we uncovered as we were exploring this um, were quite scary, particularly around young people and, and Ali made a very good point about the need to co-produce and co-design research. So we got together with young people um, last year to better understand some of their health issues um, and one of the, 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 the top one by far was stress and mental health and, and um, anxiety, uh, body image issues were by far weren't they, the, the number one issue that, 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 that cropped up. And we asked what was behind this and we know um, that social media, um, the constant need to be available and the pressures that, that social media and, and the internet creates had, had, a, had a, a part to play in, in all of that. Um, we also know that um, levels of anxiety have increased by about 70% over the last 25 years and, and no doubt social media has a, a part to play in that. Um, and then just looking some, at some of the more statistics here that uh, 1 in 10 have a diagnosable mental health condition and around half of those problems are established by 14 years old. I'm sure this, this is not news to many of you. Um, now just to look at the methodology that we adopted, so we did a campaign called Health on the High Street. This is my local parade of shops in Oval where I used to live and uh, actually if you look at it you have the convenience store at the front which if you go inside it's, it's not a lot of healthy food in there actually apart from the fruit and veg outside. And then you've got the tanning salon, the bookmaker, the fast food outlets and at the very end you've got the undertakers. And if you live in that area, you're probably more likely to go to the undertakers sooner than, than rather than later. Um, and with the health on the high street, what we what we did was we wanted to better understand the impact of business on people's health and well-being. The whole issue of clustering of unhealthy businesses in in deprived areas. Um, and what we did was we worked with experts, academics, businesses, planners, people in local authorities to to identify a, 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 what we called a Richter scale of health. So if you could look at businesses and identify how do you measure the healthiness or unhealthiness of a business. Um, and what we did was we identified in terms of business, does a business promote healthy choices? Does it promote access to health services? Does it foster community spirit? And does it promote mental well-being? And then from each of those we were able to identify what you know, a, a, a score. This was a kind of quick and dirty way of doing it, but it was it was very effective. I'll give you an example as a cake shop. So does it encourage healthy lifestyle choices? Probably not. Does it promote social interaction? Well, maybe you could come together over a cake. Um, access to healthcare services? 
we'd score at zero because it's kind of neutral. And by the way, this, the scoring is negative two to plus two, depending on whether it's healthy or unhealthy. And then does it promote mental well-being? Well, after I've had a cake, I feel very happy. So, uh, so we give a total score of plus one. And the reason I talk about that is this is kind of how we apply this to the, the work on status of minds, the one on social media. Um, and so we ended up with our league table of unhealthy sh shops. So payday loans were the unhealthiest shop. And then walking down the high street, you kind of move to the more, still in the unhealthy area. Um, then you more walk into the more healthy area. Pubs, believe it or not, score plus two because they bring people together. Um, libraries, gyms, and your high street pharmacy. So back to status of minds and social media. So what we did was we um, we talked to experts. We talked to we undertook a literature review, or rather Matt did, and we also talked to young people to better understand the positives and the negatives. How how does social media how is social media a force for good? And how does it also um, impact in a negative way on, on your health and well-being? And we came up with a scale of about 14, equally balanced between positive and negative. Um, and then what we did was we, um, we also identified the top five social media platforms that young people use. So we, we surveyed them last year um, and those are the five that we focused in on. And we asked young people to rank um, the each social media platform according to each of these different dimensions of, of health. And, uh, in terms of the positives, um, we know that social media can improve access to health experiences and health information. People can read, listen and watch other people's kind of experiences as, as we, we heard from Ali. Um, and it does, it could in, increase um, people's confidence to talk about stuff, to find out more. Um, improve health literacy um, and increase cho the choices that are available um, but bearing in mind the discussion previously about fake news we also know that there's a lot of fake information out there particularly with things like vaccinations for example or dieting so, so so much information that is just not 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 accurate we know that uh, in terms of the positives um, social media can bind people together and provide them with uh, emotional support. Uh, seven out of ten young people have said that um, they, they turn to social media in times of trouble. So it, it can provide some emotional glue. Um, and then in terms of self-expression and self-identity, particularly for young people who are going through different identity phases in their lives, this is a great opportunity for them to, to express themselves. Everything from posting something to liking something to blocking somebody, you know, it's a, these are, this is a, an important channel to which people can express themselves. And then finally, it also ena enables people to, to build upon real world relationships as well and maybe reactivate dormant relationships in their lives. So those are the main positives. The negatives, there's slightly more there, but um, um, I just to turn to them in, in, in turn anxiety and depression um, as I said anxiety and depression have, has increased by some 70% over the last 25 years um, and we know that uh, social media use, usage can exacerbate that the, the literature suggests that if you use it more than two hours a day it can have a detrimental effect on your anxiety um, and there's this whole compare and despair attitude and something called Facebook depression, which is recognised that if you use that, it can, it can increase your feelings of depression. Sleep, we did a, a, a really interesting report last year called uh, Waking Up to the Health Benefits of Sleep uh, with Oxford University. And uh, that was um, looking at how s social media usage can impact on your, your sleeping patterns. Um, you know, uh, one in five young people wake up in the middle of the night to check their um, social media accounts. I know I do sometimes. Um, and it can lead to a cycle of, you know, impacting on your sleep, making you feel tired, 
um, making you lose control, lowering your self-esteem, which can in turn make you stressed, which can in increase your, your pro problematic sleeping. So it's a bit of a vicious cycle here. Uh, body image. Uh, we know that uh, with Facebook, there are 10 million new photos uploaded to Facebook every hour. And um, we live in a very visual age and social media does exacerbate that, particularly the likes of Instagram, Snapchat and Facebook. Um, and we also know that there has been a rise in cosmetic surgery use, um, um, use of steroids, a use of supplements that have no impact at all, like protein supplements and whatever. And perhaps there is a correlation between that very visual age where you're judging people on the photographs and some of these other behaviours. Um, Cyberbullying. So again, because it's 24-7, the bullying that used to just take place within the school environment can carry on and can carry on outside of that. And Ali mentioned, you know, the, the trolling, which is just, you know, unacceptable. And then finally, the FOMO, that uh, apparently four in 10 people my age and older don't know what FOMO is. Um, don't even know what that smiley or unhappy face is. I called it an emoticon. But apparently it's an emoji. So just in case you didn't know that, it's not an emoji. I laughed at him when he said it. <laughs> but, appa but apparently, it, it, uh, older generations might call it a smiley face. Well, that's not a smiley face, but uh, anyway. Um, so yes, yeah, so FOMO, the fear of missing out, the the kind of endless procession of seeing people quaffing champagne at airports and having a great time, and then you compare yourself to you know, trudging around Iceland looking for uh, something to eat. You know, it's kind of a, your, your fear of missing out has increased. Um, and so the results from this um, piece of research, looking at each of those individually, we looked at those, those top five and what we found is YouTube um, was uh, scored much more positively in, in some of the health and wellbeing uh, indicators that we looked at and Instagram way low down and I can show you another slide here which actually breaks it down a bit a bit more so what we we saw is that uh, YouTube scores very highly in terms of awareness self-expression and community building um, and Instagram scores particularly negative on those three sleep body image and uh, fear of missing out which probably couldn't, you can potentially relate to um, so in terms of what we're calling for as an organisation um, and what we do is we, we, we often uh, double check our recommendations with young people but with this we, we also got the recommendations from academics, from young people and from others and they relate to some of the, the, the issues we found so uh, 7 in 10 young people supported the introduction of a pop-up heavy usage warning on social media about a third actually wanted to be automatically locked out and when you think about spending more than two hours a day it can be linked to you know anxiety and, and some forms of depression then perhaps that's not such a bad thing um, in terms of the digital manipulation of images um, there was very good support for um, highlighting when images had been digitally enhanced or manipulated don't know how that would work in practice, whether or not airbrush free or you know digital digitally unmanipulated or whatever the word is, could you you could do that instead? I don't know. In to, in order to tackle the um, kind of availability of fake news and not knowing what's what's real, what's what's accurate information, we suggested that the NHS England's information standard could be applied to health information to check the veracity of it if people aren't able to look at the, the source of a, an article. Um, we're big fans of uh, PSHE education um, in schools and while some of, the, um, some of the topics might be on traditional public health issues like smoking, drinking, uh, sexual health, we think that social media and um, being aware of some of the challenges around social media should be embedded within, within PSHE education. Uh, something that Facebook has done 
uh, with people at risk of uh, suicide, and I think they, they've done some kind of work with the Samaritans, um, using uh, identifying users at risk, risk of certain health issues depending on um, uh, their posts, for example, and then signposting them to accurate information. And then finally, anybody who is engaged with uh, young people to, to have some social media training as part of, as part of their work. Um, so now I'm going to play the film.